Hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. This is episode number 209, Dos Cero Nuevo. Dos Cero Nueve. O Nueve Nuevo. Is it? Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. Yeah? Nueve. Okay. Dos <laughs> Cero Nueve. As you can see, my Spanish is perfecto. Hope you guys are doing well. Buenos dias, buenas tardes, buenas noches, whatever it may be, wherever you are. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking. As you can see, your podcast app is not lying to you. I've come back for a double double back because I got off work early today. So I thought, you know what? Why not come back and record another podcast? Seeing as I'll be off this weekend, you might as well hit them with the content. Come hard. Come strong. Stroke it out. Bust in there. Don't care. Pray tomorrow. Hope she doesn't become pregnant and keep it moving. But nah, man. Sorry about that nasty. Is that, is that nasty or is that kind of adult? Adults do that, right? Adults think about that kind of things. But whatever. Um, hope you guys are well and well rested and well hydrated and all that stuff. And lucky. I'll get all that intro out of the way. Um, I'm feeling mighty fine. I just, like I've mentioned, I just got off work early today. So if we know what, let me squeeze another podcast. I did two training sessions today. I went to the gym in the morning, and I went I went for a run in the morning, I went to the gym in the evening, so I'm feeling pumped, I'm feeling strong, I'm feeling ready to go. I've got my deadlift up to 100 kg when I was before, so I was doing that for reps of five. I got my bench press up to 60 kg, which is great, considering I started really poorly there. I've got my overhead press up to 30, 40 kg, kind of, 35, 40 kg. So I'm slowly trying to inch it way up and trying to, you know, get to a place where I can, I can do overhead presses on with um, 60 kg. It's going to be a long way to go, but you know what? It's way. It's not about how long it takes you. It's about taking that first step in it. It's about taking that first step. Anyway, um, I've got loads of stuff to run through. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be away this weekend. So I thought, you know what? Why not just get some extra? Let me just table near me. Why not get some extra? content in i've got loads of stuff on the internet that i've seen this week that i wanted to talk to you guys about and then expound upon um debate about and then we can go from there in it little by little little by little so let me look at my list of topics and we can go straight in no lube attack the situation and keep it rolling okay cool so number one this is something i've just seen earlier today on my lunch break i checked this out this really cool interview with um jeremy piven on the flagrant 2 podcast i recommend you check it out i'll play a little snippet of it and then we'll talk about some of the things that he's speaking about but essentially if you know jeremy piven he's famous for playing the role of ari gold on the legendary monumental entourage tv series i'm not sure about you guys but i know for me when i used to watch entourage i used to fucking get so jealous right jealous that i didn't have that kind of group of friends around me jealous that i wasn't at that stage where i was chasing my dreams jealous that i wasn't living in la just so jealous no no show gave me more fomo or gave me more or get or made me more envious than um i'd say uh then i'd say um entourage because i think some people have the same feeling when it comes to how to make it in america how to make it in america right but i never really watched that even though it was a show that i probably should have watched considering my streetwear background and considering the fact that i was kind of thinking about doing my own brand i probably should have um watched that show but i never got around to watching it and i guess some people have the same sort of thing when it comes to um sex in the city right um some girls probably feel the same sort of thing it comes it comes at you in a monument it comes at you Sometimes you stumble upon a show at a time in your life where you're trying to figure stuff out, right? You're growing into a young adult or you're becoming a teenager and you and this show stumbles up upon your lap and it just represents everything that you want to be when you're older. Because especially when you're younger, you don't really have a good perspective of what old age looks like or being older looks like. You think your older brother that's 25, your teacher that's 29 is a granddad, right? You don't have any perspective. You don't, you, you've never seen a cool version of... Of somebody that's older maybe if it's a celebrity but for celebrities you don't, you don't really you don't really class celebrities in age until they get like over 60 they, they're just like these weird you know other 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 worldly beings to us for the most part so the first kind of interaction you have usually with a, a cooler older person is usually via a film right where they depict where they're playing a character maybe they're playing like a high school character or they're playing like a young man or they're playing a young woman or for a tv series where you're seeing them continually grow in front of your eyes so I'd imagine the same thing would be like um, 
Um, Friday Night Lights, right? That football one, Friday Night Lights, yeah? that would be one that was quite monumental in terms of shaping me as a person, influencing kind of what I wanted to do. And there was a few others, but I think Entourage really is one that really piqued my interest. Like, wow, man, they really kind of, again, made me realise just how little of a social group I have. Anyway, Ari Gold was probably one of the standout characters on there, actors in general, uh, characters, of course, but an actor as well. He really smashed it. He did a really good job of encapsulating that sleazy, um, um, machismo, uh, self-centered, conniving Hollywood agent that everyone kind of knows of, or heard about, character type, and somehow through his kind of you know real acting chops, he's able to kind of embody it all in one person and absolutely smash it. And he did a good job of it. But unfortunately, when the whole um, Me Too movement was kind of you know really hitting this precipice, and I think Harvey Weinstein had just kind of I think the first couple of real interviews. No, I think that's when that article came out in the New York Times or whatever. Is it New York Times or whatever? The kid. I forgot what his name is. The guy that read he's the son of who's the son of. Anyway, whenever that first article came out for me to, um, or the first couple of proper eyewitness detailed accounts came out about Harvey Weinstein or Harvey Weinstein, unfortunately, um, Jeremy Piven was kind of lumped in there with that sort of mess. A couple of girls alleged that he was a bit of a creep. There was another story of another lady who play who kind of um was a, was an actress alongside him during a TV show and she made something along the lines of him kind of being a little bit too handsy and a little bit too tonguey when it came to them doing a kissing scene. Loads of different stories came out of him just being a bit of a douche. And then when you marry that up with an actual allegation from somebody saying that, oh, he was sexually harassing me or whatever it may be, it kind of just, you know, it was completely over for him. They were banging for blood. He just kind of got kicked out and no one really thought anything of it for the most part. But it seems like in the last few years, he's really made him, he's tried to make amends and he's tried to come back into the fold. His career kind of stalled and if not, you know, essentially got cancelled he had the tv series mr selfridges that was out um that kind of got cancelled straight away it was based up i think it would have got cancelled anyway but still you know um it was a show based upon the person the guy that actually founded selfridges um it was a kind of a period sort of drama piece thing then he had another movie that was no, another tv series that was meant to be out too then he had a film he had loads of things in the work that just kind of you know completely crumbled i'm pretty sure he probably lost his agent because you know hollywood is hollywood is notorious for that kind of lack of backbone shit you see a lot with um. You see, you saw a little snippet of it with uh Jeffrey Star. Sorry, with the whole let me move the camera here. With the whole Jeffrey Star and James Charles situation, you heard James Charles say something along the lines of, "I think when he had the second breakdown video of what really happened, and he kind of earned everyone's favor." I remember he mentioning a little throwaway piece in the story, something along the lines of like, "Oh, the Dolan twins had unfollowed him, and then they called him privately and checked if he was okay." That was it. He's like, "What?" But then that showed you just how um just how fake and hollow those friendships are, right? The Dolan twins obviously felt felt like, you know, um, associating themselves with James Charles is going to be bad for their image or bad for their brand. They distanced themselves from him. And then privately they spoke to him and said, hey, I hope you're doing good, which is, you know, again, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the black sign and it? it's the mark of death and a kiss of death, basically. And the same thing happened to um, Ari, um, to, sorry, to, um, what's his face? Jamie Piven. No one really came out and fought his corner. He kind of got left alone, really. He tried to defend himself. He did that really crazy thing where he tried to take a polygraph test to plead his innocence, which was a real bad move. I'm pretty sure he'd uh, admit that. And in general, it just seemed like a, a bit of a, you know, locked uh, a bit of a lock and key case, right? The woman came out, said he was sexually aggressive, but he was assaulting her. Stories of him co came out of him being a bit of a creep. Add to the fact that no one really liked him. And then you've got this cacophony of just like, you know, cancelling and he's just he's out of here. But... He did speak about it a little bit on the Flagrant 2 podcast. I'm going to play a little bit of it now. And I'm not too sure what I think of his assumption. He's like, um, he's, uh, his opinion of how it went down. I'm not too sure if I believe what he's saying, but I do kind of feel some level of um, sadness. Not sad. I do, still feel some, I do feel bad for him of how it's kind of panned out and where he's in his career now because I'm sure the stand-up thing, although he's trying to do it 100% and he's really going for it, I'm sure this is the only, this is kind of like the last thing he'd want him to do, especially considering he's a, you know, a trained actor and he's done Broadway, he's done Shakespeare, he's, he's, done, a, he's done his 100,000 hours, if some, I'm sure the stand-up thing was probably something he didn't envision of his future to be, but as of course to maintain a career, maintain an income, he's got to do something, right? Um, anyway, he speaks about it a little bit. Let's play a little bit of the clip now, and then we can talk about it a little bit when we come on back on the other side. There we go. Got a lot to talk about. I do, and and what's crazy is that we're, we're living in a time right now where. Um, 
And I gotta say, if you're gonna go and do an appearance on the podcast like this, I think he does look. Maybe it's a flight. And he's been up for ages. And he's probably doing loads of sets. He does look really haggard, Jeremy Piven. He looks super haggard. The shirt, I'm not mad at. He's got a nice little vest underneath with his jaws on. But face wise, he looks really, really haggard. Really, really, really haggard. So I'm not too sure, you know, if this is really, really weighing on him. And again, I don't know how beneficial these injuries are going to be for him in general because I think the comedy people. Anyway, let's just watch it anyway. Let's find interrupt. Let's watch it. And it's not about due diligence <laughs> and, and checking on the validity of a source. It's like we got to be first, and there's no honor amongst thieves. They just want to get it out there. Man, I learned this from Skip Bayless. He was talking about what he talks on. When... Which is kind of true. I understand. I think the Me Too movement, though, was a real... I think he was unlucky in the case that he got wrapped up in that. It, imagine, if it's not true, you say oh, he's unlucky of getting wrapped up in that because there is no nuance. I think we even see what, saw with the Aziz Ansari situation that really turned out to be a really shitty date. Um, they didn't really they didn't really uh, draw any boundaries or any lines. Um, they kept going back and forth. She kept giving signs that something was going on. He, t- he kept interpreting it as something different. He kept get being, you know, doing sexual acts. She kept receiving. There was loads of weird... Um, missed signals there that really didn't go to that didn't really pan out well for anybody in either party and I think that the fact that she's not been really forthright in coming out in front of the curtain really tells you how maybe you know regretful or and yeah I don't know you probably feel bad about the whole thing maybe you don't I don't know but I think the fact that the Jeremy Piven thing I think what I realized the thing that hurts him is that he had didn't really have a good reputation beforehand Right, people always said. I think there's a quote from Adam Carolla somewhere I read where they mentioned something along the lines of, "Whenever they ask, it's like a standard Hollywood question to ask people behind the scenes, oh, who's the biggest douchebag you've ever worked with?'" Right, and they always say unequivocally, Jeremy Piven. They always say like he's a, you know, me, he's a bad dude. But I'm not sure whether or not that should justify you getting your whole career cancelled, because I'm sure he'd argue, he'd come back and say, "Hey, I might be a, a douche. I might be a bit." self-absorbed i might be a bit of a diva but how many of those people exist in the entertainment industry and he might go even further and say the entertainment industry um actively looks for those kind of people actively encourages that kind of behavior yeah with your handlers and your agents and your booking manager and all this sort of stuff it actively encourages you to be a bit you know a bit up your own ass to think your shit don't stink so he shouldn't really be blamed for it when the, when the industry kind of enables him to do it so so i, I don't know i don't know Yeah, but that's Skip Bayless, though, and he's a piece of shit. Who cares about him? That goes to show the le- the le- the lack of depth from Skip Bayless, really. But yeah, have you been you've been fucked over by that? Hundred percent. I don't know. Remains to be seen. Really, remains to be seen. Now this is the Me Too shit, correct? And as DL said to me, you took one for the team. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm a case of. It was, you got lumped in with the bad guys. Correct. And we're cleaning house. We're getting all the... Not only we clean... Well, yeah, we're cleaning house. Uh, this guy is an easy target. Um, he he is a very powerful uh, agent, right? He, That's why I think he missed the trick. I think he he said he was an easy target. He said he was collateral damage. He said the Ohugite said took one for the team. I don't really think he took one for the team. I think if you're a good dude... And you don't do shitty things to women, and you generally are quite well behaved. You won't get into this nonsense. I think even the most womanizing or womanizing people out there, as long as they're respectful, you're not going to get caught up in this nonsense. I think what Me Too did was that for all the women in Hollywood who had to put up with, because you have to imagine who Jamie Piven was before this Me Too thing happened. He was huge. He was massive. He was really influential. Maybe some of these movies in here, and some he was looking for a role, and he was trying to break out of the Ari Gold persona, blah blah blah. But he's a powerful dude in Hollywood. And if you know anything about Hollywood and you know how sucky up people are, and you know how desperate they are for fame, just look again, just just take a check, just take a little glance at the you, the Hollywood YouTube um, makeup industry. See what kind of drama happens there. Tati doesn't even live in LA and she already gets involved there. The James Charles, Jeffree Star, um, Jocelyn Hill, uh, Tana, this, that. There's so much drama. The, the, um, and everyone, everyone kind of gets involved in this crazy circus. And seeing the kind of fallout from that kind of drama gives a little glance of just how bad it must be in Hollywood. So I think for some of the women in the whole Me Too movement, it was some of it was obviously about 
putting monsters into prison, right? Um, and making sure they get punished and making sure whatever they've worked for gets stripped for them because they've ruined your life, right? Monsters like Harvey Weinstein who've done, you know, ungodly, um, really disgusting things for women in that industry. But I think for some women, it was a chance to really get their own back on guys who were just complete dickheads, right? Who just completely were dickheads all the time because they had some level of power. I've heard so many comedians say on podcasts that, you know, even working in shitty comedy stores of the amount of female comedians who, at, back in the day, who felt it was because, um, again, this was back in the day when the industry itself, this is why it's really annoying when the industry starts to be like, oh, we want to be have women involved and we don't have equal quotas. It was the industry that was telling women that it couldn't be more than two of them. It was the industry that was dissuading some women from touring together as a group because they said they have to, they were competing. They, they couldn't tour together as, as a team. It was the industry that was preventing them from headlining certain clubs because they said, you know, women can't be funny to some certain extent. So of course, there were some boneheaded guys that were furthering that narrative, but it was really the industry that was doing it. So they kind of enabled this scene where there was a powerful person who had all the jobs, who, who got all the jobs and who was on the red carpet. And then there was you, the little aspiring um, girl from, you know, outside of LA, from the middle of America, willing to do anything to make it. And sometimes kind of crossing the line to make it. Now, there are some occasions where as an adult, you might do something that you might regret just to make it with a consenting adult who's also a good dude or a good person and you do the deed and no one else needs to know and you carry on with your life and it's something that you do that you kind of are embarrassed about but it's between you and him and you t and they'll take it to the grave. But there are also some people who kind of exploit that and use it as a bit of a way to kind of get favour and pick up girls and stuff, all that sort of malarkey. So I think he was maybe throwing that line. So I think he should have been a little bit more honest and said, you know what, I was an easy target because I had done some shitty things during the time that I came Because if you would have said, look, I was, I don't know, in my late 20s and I became Ari Gold and, you know, you won't understand what that level of influence and power will do to you. It really made me think that I was better than what I was and I kind of started bugging out and I was treating women disgustingly and it caught up with me, right? Even though I didn't, I hadn't done it prior, it changed, but it, all that stuff caught up with me. That's fine. But to kind of say, you know, he was some kind of martyr and it was unwarranted, I'm not too sure because, again, I've not really heard any, again, because I listen to a lot of podcasts, right? I'm not involved in any sort of scene. I don't have any into any inside info, but the fact that you don't really see him on many other comedian other comedians podcasts in LA, right? Apart from this one, it's the first kind of comedians podcast I've seen him on. It says a lot, right, about the about how he is as a character. It says a lot about how he is as a person, and it says a lot about what they think of him in this industry. So I'm not too sure. This is right because think about this. You, it's very easy. If you've created this, you know, this, I've created this, this character. Now, they had just taken down another powerful Hollywood guy. What's another powerful Hollywood guy? I'm just as, I am a, a journeyman actor, stage actor. I, I grew up in, in extreme poverty. Um, my parents are theater actors. I grew up in... in, in I'm sure all the people on Twitter won't be happy when he says this and they don't care about his own story. stage actor. There is no white privilege. There has never been any right. white privilege. Yeah, uh, I did forty movies before I did Entourage, where I'm, you know, playing blah blah blah. You know, his best friend. Yeah. We are getting scale plus ten, and I'm grinding, and I was, I wouldn't change a thing. Right. Okay, so I've earned every crumb I've ever, you know, in, in my entire life. Right. You know, I've auditioned for all those roles, and then right. unbeknownst to me, you play a big major Hollywood guy you know who is very abrasive and we all know those people they exist and they're not so fun to, it, it, it's fun to watch yeah. but we don't really want to be around them let's be honest and that's why you put on tv it's entertaining yeah. correct yeah. you know what i'm saying anyway so, let, let me forward a little bit to a bit i want to see hold on about the evidence to support it like some college essay and we heard do you think that that same thing was with you where they were like hey this to round them up and and so that, anyway, it continues. I, I won't play the whole thing. I won't bore you guys, but you can listen to it yourself. I'll put it in the, in the show notes for you to check out. Again, a very interesting interview. I think for me, the only thing, the kind of takeaways I got from this was that um, I'm, I'm wondering what the next steps are, right? Because let's take Jeremy Piven as an example. And let's say he was some in some way culpable to the ap ap allegations. Let's say he did sexually assault some people. Or he was sexually forward. He didn't know the lines. He didn't know when when no meant no, and all that kind of like. I, I don't. I don't. I don't mean like this. I think if it's a rape and all that sort of stuff, you kind of need to just like mine out and just choose another career. I don't think you should be trying to battle and kind of make your way back. Just like 
you know, bow out with honour, be thankful you didn't go to prison and just go get another career. Um, learning this in that way. I think if it was a, you read the wrong signs or you were being a little bit, you know, a little bit sleazy and creepy, I think there should be a way back in for you because you haven't demonstrated that you're a bad person. Just demonstrate that you're, I don't know, you're a dude with too much testosterone and you just want, you know, every hole's a goal for you in that respect. And if that is the case, what's the way back to redemption? I personally think so far we haven't really seen anyone apologise the right way. But I also don't think apologies will work. I don't think there's anything anyone can say if they've been accused of being a sexual assaulter that's ever going to take that stain away. Unfortunately, I think nowadays in society with how things are set up and with the examples that we have in Harvey Weinstein, in um, who's the other guy? What's his name? Guy who drugged all the women. But because we have two such extreme... Um, Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein, because we have two such extreme examples, I think now anyone associated with those allegations is automatically now compared to them even though your crime wasn't the same even if it meant that you groped somebody or your hand or, or um, what you call it hovered down somebody's the arch of their back or you touched their bum or you gave them a kiss in the cheek and you got too close to the corner of their mouth whatever it may be because you get accused of that thing you're automatically going to be graded um next to harvey weinstein and bill cosby unfortunately it's really really sad but i also think in general what is done for for the, the good part of it is that it's cleaned up shop all the douchebags, for the most part, have gone into hiding or they've kind of um, created their ways or whatever it may be. Pay people off in the background. So I think it's done the best. So I think now if you're a girl coming up or a dude, I think you're safe for the most part. I think you're in a... In a it, someone would be really stupid if they tried to kind of do anything to you now. It would be career suicide, essentially. Um, they wouldn't really risk it. I don't think so. The eyes are all on them now. To, um, networks don't take any chances any whiff of controversy they'll just cancel you straight away you only have to look at the whole Jesse Smollett thing right in a court of law he got found he didn't get found not guilty but the case got thrown out even though everyone knows he probably did allegedly make up the whole um race um the whole homophobic attack but he got the case got thrown out if 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 Showtime wanted to they could have con easily continued just got him back on Empire just continued and ignored it like nothing else happened and carried on but they didn't because they know that smudge would never leave um, Showtime and Empire. So it will continually be a question that always gets raised when they when the actors are on press junkets or when the directors are getting interviewed. It would never go away. So they'd rather just cut their loss and just completely cancel it. Even though Empire was probably a quite a profitable show and had a really good fan base. So I think, again, the only I, I don't think we've seen that someone do a good apology. I don't think an apology would work. I don't think it would be welcomed. I think what needs to happen now is just the education amongst men, really, to just kind of fix up and make sure that we kind of police each other before these get to these kind of situations because i'm sure we have friends that we see some friends that are being a little bit too aggressive whatever it may be and you think it's entertaining because they're drunk but no i think you should be the guy to kind of pull your friend aside before it gets too far before it's the woman telling you hey you've gone too far because by that time it's another entity that you can't control and if she decides to go report it to somebody regardless of how innocent it might have been the moment it the moment it passes from her from your interaction to her interaction to somebody else's ears it's completely over for you. So yeah, um, Jeremy Piven looks like he's really trying to rescue his career. Again, I'm not sure if it's going to work or not, but, you know, um, fingers crossed it works out for him. Um, I guess, what else is on here? Oh, there's another one, actually, I want to list, list out about council culture. I think this might be um, something to talk about back to back, actually. Let's move this up here. Be, 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 be. So, talking about council culture and the dangers of it, this really interesting um, story popped up on my feed the other day that I thought was really, really, really interesting. So, this article I found on BuzzFeed was about a writer, which I've got it here on screen, who lost her book deal after calling out a DC Metro worker for eating on the train, right? So, a really innocuous kind of, you know, thing that happened um, on social. I remember seeing for the... I think I remember seeing it over the weekend or a couple of weekends ago. So, essentially, I see this tweet go out um, this lady's kind of bemoaning the fact that her trainers are late and then she's kind of commenting that, you know, somebody that works for the Metro line is eating. And I've got, I think I've got a tweet here, actually, right? Let's read the entire story from BuzzFeed. So Natasha Tynes, who said she got death threats and was forced to leave the US and, and had suicidal ideations in the viral aftermath of her tweet, right? And this is, again, coming. You, need, you guys, I implore you to read John Ronson so you've been publicly shamed. It will really change your perspective about this kind of lynch mob um, culture, cancer culture we've got going on because I really think it's kind of, it's getting to a point now where it's getting a bit scary. We saw it already with the 
with a lady that was um, speaking over Beyonce to Jay-Z during the, um, the NBA Finals. Um, it's getting a bit too crazy now. It's getting to a point where if somebody... And the problem I have is that if someone dies, no one's going to take responsibility for it. The trolls, the, the people that are going after people and trying to counsel them won't think it's their fault. They'll just think the person was overreacting. It's a very dangerous ground that we're on at the moment. So... This lady called Natasha Times is a writer, happens to be, I don't know if it's, it's like Saudi Arabia or American flag, I'm not sure what that is, somewhere in the Middle East. She tweeted the following. When you're on your morning commute and see a WMA, WMAT employee in uniform eating on the train, I thought we were not allowed to eat on the train. This is unacceptable. Hope the train responds. When I asked the employee about this, her response was, worry about yourself. Um, unsuck the DSC Metro, right? So she that's what she tweeted, right? blah blah and then you see the worker there eating her food now the thing that's really funny about this whole situation right um and then again so that that whole thing happens it gets the tweet goes out and the whole internet goes crazy they start saying that she's work shaming she like she doesn't know the story of that that lady why she needs to eat what's her business privilege all this stuff even though this lady is middle eastern thank god she's middle eastern if she was white i think her life would have been completely ruined but she's middle eastern so again they're just you know going on and on about that and then her then what transpired is that the lady that tweeted it, Natasha Times, a writer, a well-known writer, and then she had a book deal with a publishing company called Rare Bird. And as soon as that, the backlash happened, some snitches and some snakes in that whole council culture world went out and contacted the publisher and got them to kind of review their, you know, agreement with this writer and say, hey, how can you represent her when she's saying these things about um, these train workers? So the publisher, Rare Bird, tweeted out the following. A word from us on what happened this morning with Natasha Tynes in DC. And she, they made a, a tweet and then attached a note and said, Rare Bird is aware that an author distributed by us, Natasha Tynes, and published by an imprint that is subsidized by us, California, uh, Cold, Cold Blood, did something truly horrible today in tweeting a picture of a Metro worker eating her breakfast on the train this morning and drawing attention to her employer. Black women face a constant barrage of this kind of inappropriate behavior directed toward them and constant policing of their bodies. That is really not true, right? If there's one person you're not going to approach in public and take a picture of unless you think you have a reason to is a black woman, right? Because you know you're going to get knocked the fuck out. That isn't true. I don't think people do that at all. You have to be very wary of taking pictures or videos of a black lady working, especially uh, for any sort of public sector job. We think this is unacceptable and have no desire to be involved with anyone who thinks it's acceptable and jeopardize a person's duty. So essentially they dropped her. So she goes from tweeting a picture of somebody working on a, that's working on a train, eating on a train, and then complaining that her trains are always late or whatever it may be, you know, bemoaning the lack of service. And then it goes from that all of a sudden to her losing her book deal, to her moving out of the country, having suicidal thoughts, all that malarkey. Absolute crazy nonsense story, right? But what makes it interesting is the background behind it, right? Because what, what you end up happening, is, so after the whole, you know, foray of the outrages kind of stemmed and everyone's kind of got over it, the other side of the story that's more interesting is that this, is that in D.C., in Washington, those trains... um are well known for being highly policed, right? They they have police officers on the platform, police officers out the side of the station. They have p wardens inside the station who police and make sure no one eats on the platform or on the train, sorry. There's been numerous videos I've seen online of people arguing with certain people, telling them to put their food away because it gets really highly policed. They're really finicky about people eating on the train. It's a thing, right? So much so that people get fined. <coughs> on the spot fine if they do eat on a train so what the lady was doing was just bringing to light that the hypocrisy of this train station or this train services saying that the commuters can't eat but then their own staff eating on the train quite brazenly not even in a kind of sly way just sitting there eating their breakfast which is a fairly fair fair argument to kind of raise so it kind of put it into context. Again, it wasn't a racial thing. It wasn't specifically targeted at, at the woman because she was black. It didn't matter. Just whatever. Just it was about it was about her uniform, what she represented, not about her as a race. It wasn't about shaming her for the job that she had. It was basically complaining that as commuters, we get treated one way for breaking the rules, and your people who are meant to enforce these rules are breaking them themselves. How, what kind of example does that set? You have to set some kind of example, right? And but the social media was like, no, 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 they don't. She can do what she wants. She works there. It's your mind, your damn business. Well, now so it gets interesting because this Natasha Times had enough of the public outrage and was appalled that her publishing company would drop her. So then she decides to file a thirteen million dollar lawsuit against her book publisher. That's when you know cancel culture has gone too far because what you see with this story is a book publisher trying to do the right thing caving into social pressure, thinking that what they've seen on first glance is the story, when really the story is that in DC, 
they fine you if you eat on the train. So if a commuter sees that someone that works for the trains eating on the train, they have a reason to complain. In the same vein, if you remember the other story of, in Chipotle of the lady getting accused of denying services and black teens because they record her as she's denying them um, service and saying that they have to pay first, right? She gets fired and then the story kind of comes out that, oh, no, actually those black teens have go around and terrorize local Chipotles, order wraps or whatever, maybe burritos, and then run off without paying. So she was aware of who they were and was telling him, hey, you've come in here a few times. I'm not going to let you steal anymore. If you want to buy a burrito, you can, but you have to pay first. And then they offer her back a job. She says, no, thanks, and moves away. But imagine the kind of terror, imagine the kind of anguish you've caused that person in that period of time. They're being accused of, you know, being a racist or whatever it may be, like just the most abhorrent things ever. They're being targeted by people. And these are all general, these are all everyday people. Fair enough for the writer, maybe different. She might have a more of a bigger following. But imagine just being like a regular person a pl- a, a, working in your own little niche. And then suddenly you've got the whole world around you telling you that you're a horrible person. So now Natasha Tynes is suing her publisher for $30 million for, um, for I, I'm, I'm assuming, for loss of potential earnings. Really, really crazy story. So that's a picture of her. And it says here, um, a Jordanian-American author, Natasha Tynes, is suing book publisher Rare Bird for more than $30 million in damages, alleging the company defamed her and breached a publishing contract amid a race social shaming scandal in May. The incident left Tynes uh, effect, it essentially stripped of a book deal, placed on leave from her job, and hospitalized on major conditions. Jesus Christ, including suicidal force, a lawsuit filed in the week of the Supreme California County Court. Jesus Christ. So she had a regular job as well. Mamma mia. A Sunday statement from David S. Elson, attorney representing Rare Bird Books, called Times Lawsuit Baseless and pledged to fight the allegation. The counsel for Rare Bird's book and Times provided conflicting reports of Times publishing contract. Times made national and international headlines in May and was widely accused of racism as she tweeted and then deleted a photo of a black DC worker eating on a train, um, which is against Metro policy. Um, many on social media perceived Times accusation unwarranted tattletale attack on a person of colour. It's very strange, right? So it's, it's not allowed in a train. I take a picture of somebody doing it, all of a sudden I'm a racist. It's like, wow, so bizarre. As that statement paved the way for widespread media attention and ruined time reputation. And again, I'm saying this as a black person. I'd much rather, I like, it's great that people out there are trying, are, you know, vigilant and aware and kind of keeping an eye out for any kind of racial bias or attacks on minorities or whatever it may be. I'm kudos to you guys. Like, thank you. That's awesome. You're taking some work off our back. But I would much rather the attention be given to actual issues like real life issues, issues that are actually affecting people's lives, uh, people's families that are going to impact the community because this is just nonsense, isn't it really? Absolute nonsense. The worker knew she was in the wrong. The community knew she was in the wrong. Like everyone knows that that what the wrong is in this situation. The person tweets, okay, cool, maybe don't, um, what's that word called? Invade someone's privacy in that regard. It might be some privacy laws or taking people's, people's picture working, who are working on the trains. Fair enough there. But to say it's some kind of level of racism or work shaming is bizarre, right? It's similar to that girl that took a picture of the dude from uh, the Cosby show um, bagging up groceries, right? It was like, was that real work shaming or was that you just saying, oh, wow, shit, that guy who I just watched the other day on TV is now bagging my groceries. Like, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's not nice. It's not something I would do. It's not something that's very classy. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, I don't know. Again, for but again, if you're a kid and you take pictures of everything that you do, from your shits to your sandwiches, I'm not surprised you take pictures of somebody bagging your groceries. But this is like a nonsense story. And now look who's being damaged. The actual publisher is being famed for them standing up. So it's going to cost them thirty million dollars or around about because they're probably going to settle outside a court for being socially aware, right? For for fighting the social justice warrior fight. And if they just would have taken a breath, took a step back, and analyzed it properly. And came to a maybe a more of a decent resolution, it would have been fine. It's just a crazy situation. Um, Times Lawsuit outlines her position that Rare Bird, an all white company, in- inaccurately painted her, an immigrant woman of color, as racist. It's so weird. <laughs> an all white company painted a Jordanian American as racist. It's crazy. Eisen says Times, was simply su- su- Times has simply suffered consequence of her tweet. It's ironic that having taken advantage of the First Amendment rights with an ill-advised tweet, Ms. Tynes now seeks to stifle and punish us uh, use of those very same rights of respected book publisher who legitimately expressed their opinion of the, con- of the conduct rather than take responsibility for their own actions. Yeah, that might be some level of it, but you don't you don't drop someone because they tweeted a picture of somebody eating a sandwich. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, so 
crazy, crazy situation. And again, shows to me that there needs to be a revision of cancel culture. I don't think there will be because it seems like a bit of a sport nowadays, you know, to rile people up, get people's attention. Um, but yeah, this this needs to end because it's gonna again it needs to end more so on the side of the of the employees and the employers. Because it's going to cost them an arm and a leg, right? Because some people are just going to fight back. They're going to weather the storm on social. They're going to get the barrages of insults. Call me while you want to call me. Send me death threats, blah, blah, blah. And then they're going to come back and attack. That's what everyone's going to do. I think so. Um, in these kind of situations. Again, whether or not you can handle the onslaught. Because I'm sure it must be weird being a regular person. All of a sudden having thousands of people attack you over something. That you didn't think was a bad thing anyway. In the first place, it must be such a mind fuck. But it's going to start costing these companies bucks. Because people are not having it anymore. It's like, it's, she's not having it. Right, she had a panic attack. She moved out of the country, but she had look. Enough's enough. Why are you dropping me for? Yeah, I, I did a little bit of a social, uh, a little bit of a social oopsie. But is that enough to drop me and cancel my entire career because of a tweet? Like, even if it was something that was done maliciously, is it enough to cancel her whole career? That's the question you have to ask yourself. And I don't think it is. It, it might be worth a slap on the wrist. It might be worth some pointing fingers off. It might be worth people boycotting her next release and she's not getting the books. Okay, cool, but. Casting my whole career? It goes back to the Jeremy Piven thing. Super, super strange. But anyway, um, I'll keep my eye on this one because it's very, very interesting. But yeah, Natasha Tynes suing her publisher because she took a picture of somebody eating a sandwich. Mamma mia. Hi, stuff goes from zero to 100, isn't it? It's fucking interesting. Um, anyway, next on the list here, Uber Air. What the hell? Who the hell's doing this? I don't know who's doing this. I don't know why you would do this. If you are, you're an absolute psycho. But Uber the other day announced plans to... Um, use these uh, future of airborne travel uber elevate they saw these weird helicopter things uber elevate revealed its first air taxi cabin design given a preview of environmental right envi given a preview of the environment riders will travel in when they use uber air now again i'm sure this is something that's only going to be um really widely used in cities that have loads of high-rise buildings because if you don't have loads of high-rise buildings that usually means the roads are winding and all that sort of shit good kind of platform which usually leads to a lot of traffic so if you're a high-flying executive who really needs to have a service that gets you from A to B, downtown to uptown quickly, then the helicopter is probably going to be the best way to go about it. But wow, man. Wow, wow, wow. Interesting way to do things. Again, here's a little video from Uber Air that kind of displays it. You've got an, a CGI image of this weird helicopter thing. It looks a little bit like a drone at the top of a skyscraper lifting off. Hmm. Huh. I don't know, man. Would you want to get in something like this? And how's it going to work? Would it be an invite-only system, I'm assuming, right? It was pretty impressive, though, to be fair. <laughs> Fuck me. It was awesome. They signed... And that, that, that shows you how far these companies go, right? They, they start off with a service that connects riders and, riders and drivers, get them from A to B safely. It turns into... Even on paper, it sounds sketchy as fuck Uber. It turns into one of the greatest tools for um, middle-class parents that ever existed. I've heard of stories of some middle class parents giving their kids um, Uber cards that allowed them to basically get an Uber whenever they need. And kids get super excited about it because it means like they can, you know, essentially get picked up and dropped off at, at whim's notice. It's then turned, so it's allowed, you know, parents of young girls and young boys to allow them to go out and come back late at night because they know they're going to get transport right back to the doorstep and it's going to be tracked. They can alert the police if need be. And it's also enabled some kids to not waste money on leasing cars or getting a driving license, whatever it may be. Because for the most part, you could, I think there's figures that you could show a breakdown of people of how much cheaper it is to, if you want it for a whole year, just use an Uber to get back and forth from work than buying your own car outright. So it's a crazy situation. It's gone from that. All of a sudden now they're starting to go, you know what? This isn't enough. They've aced the food delivery system. They've connected businesses to people all over the, the city that they're based into. They've started to spawn this new trend of dark kitchens where people are starting up kitchens just specifically to sell on Uber Eats that aren't available on the high street. And now they're taking a step further and decided to make helicopters. <laughs> it's nutty. It's not, which goes to show it's more likely than not if somehow Uber and Tesla partner or Uber develops their own EV electronic vehicle, it's not unlikely that we'll see a fleet of Uber um, driverless cars like autonomous vehicles that pick up people from all different places around the world and then that might be a good alternative to the idea I said about having pickup points at major metropolitan cities like Oxford Street, Bond Street, whatever it may be Kiosk Square, if your battery runs out you could um, order an Uber exactly from there, I think they would just rather have autonomous vehicles that just line up along the street, they just jump into uh, put in your code and they'll just debit you when you get back home, 
But yeah, an amazing video. Let's play it again here. Wow, man. Wow. I'd be scared as, as fuck to go in it. Really would be, but it does look incredible. It looks absolutely incredible. Wow. Here it is. The propellers kind of pivoting. And now it's flying normally. And this is just a, a concept for now. This is the only thing I'm annoyed about because I think if this is Tesla and if it's Apple, they show us the real thing, right? They don't show us um, CGI stuff. They show us the real thing, at least like some element of it. There's anything I'm a little bit, I'm not sure how close we're going to get to an actual, to seeing this thing actually working in the air. But again, it's close enough, I guess, for now. Peering through the skies. Wow. That is insane. So I'm assuming, where's it going to stop? On only high rises, right? Because I'm sure they won't have, because I think to get around, I've read somewhere, to get around the aviation laws because they won't have a permission to go land on runways or only have to land on rooftops and stuff um so people with like you know um look what's it called like landing pads on top that's the only place they'll be able to land on so it'll be only be designated areas although it might mean uber kind of partnering up with certain buildings um and then kind of leasing out their um landing pads that probably don't get used that often and only when they're really meeting high flying i wonder who actually use helicopters in the city is it like partners only I, would, I don't think executives will have that kind of privilege, right? It's usually high-flying people coming in, like clients maybe from the Middle East and Far East and South Africa, and maybe your big partners in your firm going out that way. But I wouldn't think anyone else would use it. But again, I, I don't know. I don't know. I wonder how much money will be actually in this and the level of use will come from it. I don't know, man. I'm not sure it will actually be as useful as people, as they maybe think it will be. But again, these people are much smarter than we are. So here's a, here's a landing... Beta is landing us now retracting down into an underground car park of sorts. Wow. The board moves along and what? The people can chop out there? This looks really cool, man. The design of it. People jump out of the helicopter pad and onto their day. That is insane. That is really, really insane. Again, not too sure how willing i would be when in collaboration with bipolar studio when's it going to come out no date so far when it's going to come out but yeah that's um interesting and again i'm not too sure who's going to actually use it but it's good to dream they've got a second video for them too what's the second one i saw here um there's a second video too oh it's just showing the actual cockpit inside wow it's autonomous as well i'm assuming it's them showing you inside the thing 360 view which looks pretty cool all right let's see the other one i think that was just a standard helicopter right let's see what that looks like but yeah it's interesting concept i'm not too sure again i'm not too sure what use it'll be of it because again maybe you have to be a high flying executive to really kind of understand it for the most part but it looks very interesting by setting the world in motion. Let's see what they say here. Transition from being a company that's all about ride sharing to a company that's a platform for all different types of transportation. One of those is air. That is crazy. Living in cities where people live in three dimensions in Scott. Do you think we're going to get... Uh, well, I wonder what Travis Kilkanis thinks of all this stuff right now. Is he kicking himself? Is he proud of where the company's gone? Hmm. Um, yeah, he's doing quite a good job at the moment, Dara. But, um, yeah. Will this mean we're going to see Uber planes? Uh, that would be nuts. Imagine Uber just comes in and because the aviation, the aviation industry is ripe for a fucking pulling up the branches, right? Root and stem. They get away with so many liberties, right? Look, the amount of people that complain online about the service they've had with Virgin and British Airways, it's like, hey, who cares though, innit? You're still gonna go back. You have no other option. Um, imagine if Uber came in and said, look, you trust us with your late night rides. You trust your kids with us. Um, you go to airports with us on last minute they'll come and you woke up too late like I've done plenty of times why not get jump in our plane <gighs> let's see skyscrapers they work in three dimensions in skyscrapers and you have a transportation grid that's in two dimensions that transportation grid will not be able to keep up with three dimensional life that's and similar to what um, Elon Musk said about the boring company he said we live in a 2D no 2D 3D world but our transport is 2D so essentially tunnels were the way to kind of get around it because you can build unlimited amount of tunnels. They can overlap. They don't, you know what I mean? They can get really close to each other. Um, and obviously in being, and I think you mentioned being in the sky. It's like, would you want to, uh, it's like uh, the same troubles that we have with um, cars. That's probably why it's autonomous. I've really figured it out. You mentioned that we have drivers. He said that how, how um, happy would you be to have the same people that 
drive day to day then suddenly having cars that fly in the sky right it'll be fucking bedlam right imagine the amount of cars dropping out of the sky falling um that's the only trouble as well you think of it too if one drops which is likely to might completely burn them but anyways continue electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft are really the key to doing what we've wanted to do for many years and that is be able to overcome the gridlock that's on the ground in the cities skyscrapers change cities by taking advantage of the space above cities urban aviation will do the same and in the process it will reduce congestion on the ground and make our cities feel more open and more accessible for everyone Aerial ride sharing is about combining eVTOL technology, which provides affordable, clean, yes, and quiet of product. takeoff. That's look beautiful, though, isn't it? Combining that with the ride sharing platform that Uber has built to get high utilization and load factor into those aircraft. Wow. We would still have those existing ground transportation options, but we would supplement some of the most congested routes in the city with a flight portion. Yeah. Let's say a car or bike or some other form of transport it takes you to what we call our skyports you would then fly five or ten minutes over the most congested part of your journey and when you land it there would be another form of transportation to take you to your final destination okay in-house we're building software capabilities it's a bit long though isn't it really but i get it um yeah yeah i don't know it's a bit long though going one part of your trip on the uber and then jumping into a skyscraper getting a helicopter then continue again that whole journey will probably take a lot longer than just sitting in the same position no and waiting for the traffic to clear up. I don't know. Well, safe operations of vehicles in our network. And then we're looking outside for world-class partnerships with aviation companies who are building the aircraft. We're developing requirements for our vehicles. Oh, I love a bit of good so product design. Whoa. Design Exploding aircraft. illustrations, a bit of CAD. That our customers have. Aircraft will be taking off and landing in very densely populated, concentrated cities in places where real estate's pretty scarce. To be able to do this, we're partnering with some of the world's best real estate owners. Oh yeah, see, I knew it, yeah. Operators there you to go. unlock new capacity Indeed. taking off and landing aircraft across our cities. That's awesome. There's a lot that has to happen collaboratively with both the Federal Aviation Administration and our international regulators worldwide. Additionally, community acceptance is absolutely key to getting this product up and running. That sounds cool, man. Uh, again, I, I won't play the whole thing, but you can check it out. That sounds really cool. Uber Air coming to a place to you very soon. Um, I'm guessing it'll be quite expensive too. Maybe not, but I, I assume they'll probably start introducing this at the premium level and then maybe kind of trickling it down with demand as it goes along. But that'll be pretty cool to see as it um, evolves. Um, what is next here on the list? Let's keep rattling on. Yes, 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 I right here. Yeah, there's these um, amazing collection of vans I just seen the other day, which look flipping phenomenal. I'm not very familiar with the collaborator, but just by look, they just look great. Um, the headline is Soul Classics and Vans come together for a Ohio Fun Collection. I'm guessing Soul Classics is the retailer or the brand they've collaborated with. They've got four models here, a sl two slip-ons, a chucker and a skate high. They look phenomenal. I'll probably pass on the skate high. Um, again, maybe. But I don't really like things that look like moccasins or that look like FBTs. I'd rather just get FBTs. They're kind of like frayed fingers on the top. But the two uh, slip-ons and the chucker, especially the, that, that slip-on there, that's sort of like iridescent looking wise. And that chucker right here, the purple one, are so beautiful. They remind me of the golden ages of back in the day Supreme Collabos with the chuckers. They just look phenomenal. Um, they're due to come out when? They're due to come out on the 26th, probably between 90 to 100 fifty dollars which is crazily good um again i want everything in this collection i want the trousers the guys wearing with the purple shoes they look flipping phenomenal they've even got some illustrations some sorry some text on the bottom of it spelling out ohio funk if you get the whole pack um again the purple here with those tie-dye trousers look phenomenal um these ones that this girl has up looking really good as well the purple ones are my favorite the chuckers they look great look at those look how great they look that's that's my favorite pair so far they look banging. What's that? June, what? 26, I said, right? Oh, so, so good. And then the second one here, you've got the vat. Yeah, this slip ones looks really nice. Um, I like the fact this white fox in satin upper, uh, red satin. Yeah, red velvet or something. Satin or red velvet. They're velvet. Um, emboss, embossing on it as well. Um, this look amazing all white red tab again i'm not a fan of skate high i'll kind of skip on those one for the most part i like this i know it's not iridescent whatever that is what is that um sequin not sequin what do you call that material i'm not sure but i love the sole as well no foxing completely translucent looks like so far with the sole 
But yeah, those two are my favourites. I'd I'd be all over them. Hopefully they're men. So hopefully they're not women's and they just they do them from small sizes to high sizes. I'll get them in a heartbeat. But I definitely recommend you check them out. Um, Soul Classics and Vans, uh, pack of shoes. You've got four packs there: Skate High, Chucker, and two slip-ons. They look amazing. Soul Classics, you smashed it. Great, great collaboration, man. June twenty-six drop date. Um, what else do we have here? London Fashion Week, men's streetwear, street style, style, street style. These these slashes are always quite cool because you get sometimes you get some inspiration for outfits that you want to wear. Um, London Fashion Week has just ended. We're in Petit Umo season now. Everyone's in Florence, so um, you'll probably see a lot of that coverage popping up soon. Then it's Milan, uh, then it's Paris, right? And then it's kind of over. So Paris is usually where the big dogs come out. London's been pretty good. We've had some stellar collections from Charles Jeffrey and Craig Green and a Cold Wall and a few others um, that I mentioned in the previous podcast, but it's sort of like most, most of a street style thing where street style photographers take pictures of people coming in and out of shows during the season. And this is the London uh, menswear show. So sometimes, again, like I mentioned, you get some inspiration from this. Let's see what people are wearing. Um, first slide, not really a fan of anything that's on there. The trousers look okay. I'm not, I'm, I'm not too mad at the boots. Um, again, I like the trench, the length of the coats. This season has been quite long, even though it's spring. I like that guy's Mac on the left. Looks like a Burberry trench jacket. Yes, it is. Um, Yeshua Simmons with a Burberry trench and a Prada bag. You go, sir. And the lady there, Simona Rasmussen. And uh, no. Oh, that's Simon Rasmussen. And that's Vogue's Chioma Nadi. Um, again, yeah. So nice bag. Nice length of coats. Oh, jacket. Sorry, that go past the knee. So you're going to see a lot of that hopefully coming up next few seasons. Again, another kind of form of it. More so a rain jacket that go past the knee. I like this kind of mix of outfits. Well, I wouldn't wear it personally, but I like the fact she's got the little poppy. Those kind of poppy pants, Adidas ones, are really nice. They? They're quite versatile to wear. I've seen a lot of people kind of use them in interesting ways. Um, you could do the whole LA foot look, right? Um, with kind of having it rise up for your girl and showing your bare leg. You can have it kind of um, tucked in or tied, tucked into trousers, tucked into socks or splayed out wearing Air Maxes, sort of like in kind of a Berlin style. You can kind of do it this way. I like how it's quite versatile, those pants in general for the most part. Um, I'm a fan of the shoes. I think easily maybe this year, this might be the shoe of the year, um, the Sakai and Nike, um, what was it called, LDV? And he's got Isimiyaki pants, right? Pleats, yeah, of course. Um, but that's a Kai... I call those the reggae's, the yellow and greens. They're easily, easily the best shoes collection-wise overall. Um, the best probably collaboration we've seen this year. Um, the rest of the look, I'm not really a fan of. I'm not really a fan of bucket hats, especially with long hair, especially with glasses. Kind of look like a bit of a pedo. In my opinion, I don't. it's not a pedo, I'm just saying. You just look like one if you're wearing those kind of things. Um, not a fan of the jacket. I quite like the girl's dress. Uh, yeah, the... the, the Oh, I like the color on this guy's top. I like the trousers with the belt, kind of a bit high waist. I like that bag as well. Again, another long coat. Maybe because the weather in general, so you're going to see a lot of it. But I think that's the one. Never, we've got another some popping pins on the side there. That might be Moschino. Is that Jeremy Scott? No, it isn't. Probably somebody else. Rain jacket. Another rain jacket there. Oh, again, another long coat. So you're going to see loads of long coats this season or coming up for a full winter, probably. Um, I'm not really a fan of this guy's look either. It looks a bit shit. I like this as well. Another long coat. Oh, I like that. That looks really nice. Uh, that's Ben Cobb. Oh, yeah. I think he, he, he's, he's, he's usually swagging anyway, this guy. I've seen him before with his moustache. Um, I like that long trench there. He's swagging it really well there. That tartan. What is that? Is that Stussy? Oh, I like that. Actually. It looks really nice. It's Stussy, right? Oh. oh, that might be the Stussy dude, actually. That might be the... Um, what's his name? The guy that owns it now. Or the guy that's the main owner of Stussy. He's fairly young looking. He looks like that, right? I forgot his name. But yeah, that jacket is really nice. Tartan, sort of like, what would you call it? Work jacket? Not work jacket. What, what are they called, those kind of jackets? Two side slit pockets with a little zip pocket here on the top. What are they usually called? Oh, I forgot the name of it. Anyway, it looks really nice. I like that. I'm assuming it's something that's not out yet at the moment, so probably a sample. Um, but that looks really cool. I have another Craig Green piece. People love Craig Green. That's the one thing I'm happy about London, this new generation. Even though there's some people that pontificate on show studio and stuff and just talk about things they're never going to buy and criticize things that aren't 
necessarily something they'll be into anyway i think the people that do like fashion in london really rep the brands they love they support them and they buy their stuff like people actually buy craig green clothes because they like him as a person they follow him as a designer some people intern for him or they know people that worked for him and they fucking buy his stuff they buy it and it's awesome to see man especially during the shows like people come out in their flocks and wear head to toe craig green kind of rem reminds a little bit of rick owen shows when you see pictures of people outside you see exit videos you see actually people wearing head to toe rick owens archive pieces sample pieces things they've got gifted to them and really repping hard for him so i guess that's why that's that's a really good sign to see for a designer because for the longest time we always see a lot of kids talking about fashion and no one wearing anything everyone looking like they went to beyond retro every single day which isn't bad but again if you're gonna you know if you're gonna get involved if you're gonna get be part of the that scene at least kind of dip and dabble and buy some stuff man what, what's the fun in it if you're not gonna get involved um so yeah nice craig green piece there again a nice trench there oh look at the virgil lv shoes another instance of them looking nice when they're not in out when they're kind of out of context i quite like how they look there um very nicely done um, I'm a, I'm a fan of the dyed hair here. I think this kid dyed hair looks awesome. I wish I could dye my hair that color. Actually, again, if I was a kid and I was that age, I'd be swagging out outside every fashion show. I'd have my best outfit on. I don't care if I'm invited or not. I'd be there every single day getting my looks off. Now I'm at the age where I don't give a give a shit. But I think at that age, I'd have it. I'd have my harness bag on, my hoodie, basketball shorts, my trendy little sandal socks things off white belt that looks like yeah he's doing the damn thing man Get, keep doing your thing i like his sunglasses as well what are they i wonder if sunglasses are but again i wish i could dye my hair that color i don't think i can kind of neon green but he looks good the kids out here doing the damn thing i'm not a fan of this guy's look at all um the tweed kind of brown outfit with a navy blue mm, not for me personally too art school for me um yeah definitely not a fan of that either what's that bucky hat with the waist uh eh, with a wool vest and a short sleeve shirt with a tie on and the things tucked into this people that tuck jumpers into trousers there's a special place in healthy isn't it no or is it just me people are, why are you tucking jumpers into trousers what is this stuff it's a styling trick i know for stylists it's a good way to kind of you know get the jumper and the belt and the trousers all in one look without kind of hiding anything i get it it's like when people put that little it's like what girls do it's like that, that styling trick where they kind of tuck one half of the shirt in and leave it hanging so you get to see the waistband fine but tucking a whole jumper into a pair of trousers man you guys are bugging um again nice trench again we're seeing loads of length on the coats i like this guy's look actually very very relaxed with the converse um with the jw <laughs> are they Luebe or jw anderson regardless jw anderson designed them um converse is Glitter on both sides again. I wish I could wear Converse One Stars. I'd be so over this look, but I just my feet are so wide it isn't going to happen. Even though we probably have the same length of foot, his feet is much. His feet are much skinnier than mine are. But I love these pants. They're sort of high waisted white. I don't know what they are. They carpeted pants. They they sit really well. And he's got the lace on there again. I'm a big fan of the lace. Big up the lace gang, right? No need for belts. A nice shirt. Yeah, it's a really nice look. I, if anything, I'd probably swap the t-shirt for a nice white one just to go all white, or maybe something a little bit. A, of a lighter gray in central but you know he's swagging it he's doing a damn thing he doesn't need my help um again he got another look here which i'm not a fan of but i like that kind of lace thing on the inside whatever that is whoa that waistcoat is sick i like that i love some good looks in london this season actually i'm not I'm not mad at it i like that girl's jumper and smile looks amazing nice waist high waisted jeans there uh the bandana stuff i'm a little bit tired of but again looks cool he's doing his thing this look is really hard really sharp i like this Love the glasses. It, it reminds you. Of, it reminds me of the outfit. It reminds me of what we see of behind the scenes pictures of him. Do you know um what's that new Quentin Tarantino movie that's coming out based on the on the Manson murders? Um, it looks like something Brad Pitt wore during filming, right? It looks. Yeah, doesn't it look something like that. He looked had a similar kind of look or Leonardo. That kind of there's loads of browns. Um, yeah, the cowboy boots look awesome. Whether that bag is looks fucking cool. Yeah, I love that. I, I love the fucking just position of that outfit and then seeing a fucking you know a smartphone in his hand that's super awesome <laughs> that outfit looks like it's straight out of the 70s and he's got an iphone in his hand serious um oh i like that shirt that shirt's really nice we're gonna see a lot of that this season right those kind of um patterned shirts and shit long sleeve um short sleeve not really a fan of that jacket at all boots tucked into jeans go and jump off a cliff again not a fan of that you know even with the topless i rate for that but not a fan that again not a fan of that um, the jumper's nice. I don't like the bag or the trousers, but what do I know? Again, kids out here doing... Oh, it's the same kid, isn't it? Did he dye his hair another colour? No. See, that's what I would be doing. I would be going out every day just swagging. 
right? He's doing the damn thing. He's got his little off-white bag on. He's probably got a little sponsor there. They're telling him to go out and wear certain outfits. Just do the damn thing. Go out every day and just get your looks off. Sick. Um, not a fan of any of that. Oh, I like that girl's beret, actually. In fact, oh, I like her cigarette earrings, too. I, I just, just realized that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, what else we see? Got another lady here wearing a nice little bag. I quite like her hair. Um, yeah, some questionable outfits here. The 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 babushka over the woolly hat. Not so much a fan of. I think she let his hair down a little bit. I think he look probably a lot better. Um, the leather jacket looks pretty hard there. Not a fan of that at all. Like that guy's look. Loads of pastels in there. Pale colors in that. Whatever looks pretty nice. Little Stussy shirt there, not mad at that. That what is that? Is that oh that's Dreams Van Noten, right? I was gonna say that is that um somebody else. But that's really nice. I like the cut on that. Is that like a what is that? Is that a coach jacket? That looks fucking cool. I love the cut on that. That pattern looks amazing. Oof, that is swaggy as fuck. Um, not a fan of that at all. What's that? Burberry trench coat turned inside out. Probably to show off the label. Gotta do what you gotta do. If you pay the money for it, why not? Um, Supreme and Clark's Wallabies, the bandana print, pass. Um, I like this guy's look. Oh, I love the trousers. Oh, I love the suit. I love everything here. This is really nice. I don't know what who this is by. Uh, th- th- that's Etsy, right? Shoes. I don't know who this is by, actually. I'm going to say Craig Green, but I don't think so. The, what's the boy is that with the white string? I wonder who that is. Oh, I love it. It looks really cool, though. Yeah, some good stuff here. Yeah, not really a fan of that look at all, but hey, people. some people like that kind of look. Again, not really a fan of that double denim. Pretty heavy for me. Like that lady's trench. And yeah, I love the color combinations and the bag again. Oh, that's the same lady, right? Chioma and Denny. Yeah, she smashed it. Chioma and Nadi. Um, yeah, this guy's suit probably looks quite cool, but again, not for me. Oh, the trousers on that. Look at the fucking trousers on that. Hey? They look pretty nice. Steve Harvey, he eat your eat your flipping heart out, mate. He's doing a damn thing. Not a fan of that at all, personally. Looks a bit too alright, mate. <laughs> um, yeah, pass on that one as well. Couple of good looks here and there. That haircut is a madness, isn't it? He's going for it, bro. Wow. <laughs> I thought my bonnet was a, you know, a bold move. But that's a bold move, man. It's a bold move with the facial hair as well. That's a bold move, man. You really have to go for it, innit? You have to hope you have a face. Some haircuts you have to hope you have a face like that. Whoa, he's definitely man's not hot, innit? Jesus Christ, a beret over a hoodie. With glasses, tactical vest under a hoodie. Like, that is a fucking... Yeah, that's a look. Fashion's hard, though, isn't it? You have to try. And you have to just really be not self-conscious and not... You know, you're aware that you look like a bit of a tool, but you don't care. Fashion's that weird thing. That's what fashion is, anyway. Style isn't. Style, you just wear stuff that you like. You mix and match. You throw stuff in. You throw stuff out. You try different things. But fashion is like... You really have to have a, you know, backbone. You really have to have, like... You know, I don't know, balls of steel to kind of wear fashion fashion. Well, like this guy's shirt, it looks quite cool. But yeah, some pretty cool stuff for all in all. Recommend you check it out. I'll put it in the show notes anyway. It's a Vogue um, slideshow of all the best street star pictures uh, during this season at London Fashion Week. Um, you know what? I think that might be a good place to end. Actually, no, one more. Dil Sa- Aida Samba. you seen this? I just checked this out the other day too. Jason Dill has finally got his own standalone shoe with Adidas that isn't part of the fucking awesome thing, but just his own shoe. Um, if you're familiar with Jason Dill, you know that everyone that isn't familiar with him is obsessed with the things that he's wearing on his feet. Whatever he wears, we go out and buy because we're Jason Dill fanboys and we love everything that he does. We love hockey. We love fucking awesome. We love Dill. So he's got a new shoe that just got announced recently that looks banging. And even though I don't skate as much as I did previously, I'm still going to wear them. I'm still going to skate down the street with wearing them once and then start swagging them out when i'm out with my friends here's a short little video showing some of it let's play it it's only a couple minutes long right how long is it Do-do, come on yeah there you go oh i love it i love his little studio with all the things hanging up he doesn't have a desk he just paints that sitting down and stuff love it love it love him playing football and stuff what is an all white samba right do we, we don't see pictures of it i uh, all together do we Samba with a gum sole. Ooh, he, good, good move. Good move, Jason Dill. Gum sole on the Sambas. They look banging. Oh, look how good he looks on the skateboard. Some people are just meant to be riding skateboards, and it? it's nothing else, right? Seeing Jason Dill just ollie up things. 
all the up and down things, right? Board slide, like nose blunts, like I just don't know, man. Oh, look how good that looks! It's a translucent soul. Woohoo! Again, my feet are too wide for them, but I'm gonna get them regardless. I don't care. I don't care. Literally, he could sell me anything. He could sell me a white T-shirt, Jason Dill. He really could. <laughs> he could sell me a white tee if if it sat the right way. Oh, when they're due to come out, June fifteenth. Um, no further pictures of them or what they look like, but again, white sambas, um, translucent soul. You can't go wrong, really. Oh, congratulations, Jason Dill, man. Smasher. Anyway. I'm going to put my boner away for Jason Dill. And I'm going to say this is the end of the show. Thanks so much for tuning in. As always, I'll see you guys again tomorrow for an episode of the show. As always, links to my social and all that stuff are going to be in the link below. In the description, sorry, if you're watching via YouTube. If you're on a podcast app, leave me a five-star review. And I'll see you guys again very, 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 very soon for another episode of the show. Peace, take care, and see you again soon. Bye.